Welcome everyone to the Asan Institute for Policy Studies. Thank you for coming out today. Uh, at this time, I'd like to introduce the Vice President of the Asan Institute, Dr. Che Kang. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to thank you for your coming on behalf of Dr. Ham Jebong, the President of I, uh, Asan Institute, and MJ Jung, Honorary Chairman of Asan Institute. Both of them are in London to make a speech in the conference called Leaders in Football. So actually, he, 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 their hearts actually are with us despite their physical presence over there. So please, uh, I have to make an excuse for their absence, but actually they have, uh, have, uh, have sent a very uh, best regard to Mr. Blinken and all his delegation. Actually, today we have a very special guest. You know, he doesn't need any introduction. He's been already quoted by media already. So very popular, maybe the most popular person in town today, at least. I'm sure that he doesn't need any kinds of introduction at all. He, uh, everyone has his bio, so he has a tremendous career, and also the serving the government and working on the research community in the CSIS. So I'm sure uh, you will be benefited by his presence and also his uh, knowledge and experience in foreign affairs and national security matters very much. So I'm not going to read his bio at all. So instead of actually, we need to have more time for his deliberation, and then he eager to take some questions. I'm sure that Mr. Blinken is going to take some questions from the floor. Please join me thanking uh, for joining in, in, the, in joining in welcoming the Mr. Blinken with a, a warm round of applause, please. Well, thank you all very, very much uh, for the, the very warm welcome. And I have to say, I think it is testimony to the wisdom of the leadership of this institute that given the choice between football and listening to me, they chose football. It was a very wise decision. Um, but in all seriousness, Dr. Che, thank you for your very, very warm welcome. Uh, we are grateful to count you and your colleagues here as close friends of the embassy, and of the United States. In just a few short years, the Asan Institute has become a model among its global peers for its research and scholarship, so it's particularly good to be with you today. Um, I'd also like to take a minute to recognize some of my colleagues from the United States who are with me today, especially uh, Ambassador Sung Kim, our former ambassador to the Republic of Korea, and now Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Korea and Japan, and Special Representative for North Korea Policy. Sung, it's great to be with you, as always. And of course, um, Ambassador Mark Lippert, uh, a great friend. Uh, the Republic of Korea could not ask for a more talented, more committed, or more sincere envoy from the American people. Mark's leadership has done a lot to further our relations, uh, although if we're being honest, we know that it has a lot to do with his long ears and soulful eyes. Uh, actually, I'm sorry, I meant his basset hound Grigsby's long ears and soulful eyes. Uh, nearly eight months ago, the very first stop of the very first trip that I took in my capacity as Deputy Secretary of State brought me right here to Seoul. That trip left a great impression on me, and I've been eager to return. And while I may be a week late for Chuseok, it is still wonderful to be here with a growing group of friends. Uh, when I was moving from the White House, where I worked for six and a half years, to the State Department at the very beginning of this year, uh, I asked President Obama what he most wanted me to focus on. And his answer was immediate and simple, Asia. And then when I got over to the State Department, I asked Secretary Kerry exactly the same question. And he gave me the same answer, which is always a very good sign. And that answer was Asia. It's a clear reflection of the importance that both President Obama and Secretary Kerry attach to the region. And maybe the best evidence of this fact is that over the course of just a few months, President Obama is receiving at the White House the leaders of Japan, China, and of course, next week, South Korea. The reason for this focus is very simple. Nowhere in the world are our economic and strategic opportunities clearer or more compelling than in the Asia Pacific, home to three of our top 10 trading partners and some of the most wired cities 
and innovative minds in the world. Our alliance with South Korea is at the core of this rebalance. It was forged in the shared sacrifice of war more than 60 years ago. Today, our commitment to a secure, stable, and prosperous Korean Peninsula continues to animate the alliance. And we can take great pride in our work to strengthen its pillars. We've strengthened our shared prosperity with a high standard free trade agreement that will spur growth both in South Korea and the United States. We've strengthened our shared security by modernizing key defense agreements. And we've strengthened the close bonds between our people by expanding educational and exchange opportunities for scholars, for soldiers, for innovators. Today, in fact, there are more Korean students studying in the United States per capita than students from any other country in the world. And that's something that we're very proud of. Increasingly, though, our partnership is not just about what we're doing to preserve a secure, stable, and peaceful Korean peninsula. It's moving to a regional partnership, to a global partnership, and even beyond into space. The great breadth of our shared interests has been the subject of my many meetings here in Seoul over the last two days, and it will be the focus of conversation between President Obama and President Park next week. What I'd like to do this evening is speak to you briefly about the importance of our alliance and describe how cooperation between the United States and South Korea sets an example for the region and, indeed, for the world. Yesterday, when I arrived uh, in South Korea, I went to the DMZ. There, I was honored to share a meal with Korean and American soldiers who serve every day side by side. They are the living embodiment of our alliance. They stand sentry against North Korea and its provocative, destabilizing, and repressive actions. For decades, the DPRK has cut itself off from, global, from the global community, isolating its own citizens from the prosperity, the progress, and opportunity that the world has to offer, and that is plainly in sight on the other side of the DMZ. Together with the international community, we've tried to show North Korea that a brighter future is possible if North Korea chooses a different path, if it refrains from actions that threaten regional security and peace, if it abandons destabilizing provocations, if it ceases its deplorable violations of human rights, and if it fulfills its denuclearization obligations. Any attempt by North Korea to launch a so-called satellite using ballistic missile technology or to test a nuclear device would be reckless, irresponsible, and a clear violation of existing United Nations Security Council resolutions. The most recent of those resolutions states that further violations will result in significant measures by the international community. Pyongyang must understand that that is exactly what will happen. Our own unity and determination in the face of these provocations has played a vital and indeed stabilizing role. This was especially important just two months ago when North Korean soldiers placed landmines in the DMZ and tragically maimed two Korean soldiers. Our response was appropriately calm and resolute because of the trust and confidence that we built through our close coordination and thanks to President Park's strong leadership. The United States is and will remain open to engaging with North Korea and together with our partners eventually negotiating with it, provided Pyongyang demonstrates it is serious about denuclearization. Now, I know that some people are skeptical about the willingness of the United States to engage. And to them, I would say, look no further than this summer when we concluded a deal with Iran that will prevent it from acquiring nuclear weapons. We succeeded because Iran first agreed to freeze its program and to allow international inspectors to come into the country. That created the time and space in which we were able to negotiate a comprehensive agreement. Or, to those skeptics, I would say, consider the fact that over the past year, in addition to the nuclear agreement with Iran, President Obama resumed diplomatic relations with Cuba and welcomed the leader of Vietnam's Communist Party into the Oval Office. In other words, we engaged and made important progress with three countries, Iran, Cuba, and Vietnam, with whom we have long and complicated histories. 
The United States and South Korea are also working together to press the DPRK to close its prison camps, lift its repressive policies, and halt its assault on the dignity and freedom of its own citizens. We fully support the new UN Human Rights Field Office in Seoul and its mandate to document the DPRK's human rights violations. And we continue to urge the international community to stand up to this behavior, including through the UN General Assembly Third Committee session later this month. We in the United States share President Park's vision for peaceful reunification, a unified peninsula free of nuclear weapons where all its people enjoy the same social, economic, and political freedoms that have propelled the Republic of Korea to such extraordinary heights. President Park's visit to Washington next week will strengthen our resolve in meeting these challenges. It will also energize our efforts to pioneer together new frontiers, frontiers in technological innovation in cyberspace, where the Republic of Korea remains an unquestioned leader in recognizing both the power and the risks of global connectivity. Over the last two days, I've had the opportunity to meet not just with my counterparts in government, but with some of South Korea's most enterprising students, engineers, and entrepreneurs, including those at the Fab Lab, where young innovators meet to turn their ideas into practical reality. Their talent is extraordinary, and so is their desire to think big. They don't just want to create for the sake of innovation. They want to create for the sake of humanity. They want to answer questions like, how do we scale access to affordable clean energy? How do we harness the revolution in robotics? Our ability to solve these kinds of challenges and others will be determined by our success in connecting these brightest problem solvers to one another and to our greatest problems. The Republic of Korea and the United States are also pioneering new frontiers, quite literally, in space research and exploration. We were very pleased that South Korea is part of the community of responsible and peaceful spacefaring nations, and we look forward to working together on aeronautics, deep space communications, and solar system exploration. We're pioneering new fr frontiers in health security, sharing the Republic of Korea's expertise in medicine and health with those around the world who most need it. Think about it. This time last year, doctors from both of our nations were working side by side at great personal risk to fight the scourge of Ebola halfway around the world. Building on this experience, President Park recently hosted 56 partner countries and international organizations as part of the global health security agenda, an effort to prevent future outbreaks from becoming epidemics. Korea's leadership in this area, including by building the capacity of other countries to prevent, to detect, and to respond to the outbreak of disease, is making a big difference, and it will literally save lives. And we're pioneering new frontiers in environment and clean energy as the global community works towards a new climate change agreement this year in Paris. Already, Korea is playing an important role by hosting the Green Climate, Green climate Fund and implementing the world's second largest carbon emissions trading scheme. And we look forward to seeing a carbon-free Jeju Island by the year 2030. So what all of this tells us is that our partnership is increasingly far-reaching. But all of these efforts would not be possible without the foundation of our alliance that allows us to seize new opportunities to the benefit of both of our countries. The same is true for the wider region. Constructive relationships in Northeast Asia, among China, Japan, and South Korea, advance the security and prosperity of each of us and serve the interests of all of us. Good relations among our neighbors complement our alliance system, and we welcome the decision by the three leaders to meet in a few weeks. As these relationships strengthen and improve, we will continue to rely on our two close allies the Republic of Korea and Japan, to serve as examples for the region, to model their enduring commitment to democracy and free markets, peace, and stability. Our growing trilateral cooperation among the United States, the Republic of Korea, and Japan also offers new opportunities to enhance security across the region. Just uh, a week ago at the United Nations General Assembly, 
Uh, I was able to join Secretary Kerry as he met with Foreign Minister Kishida and Foreign Minister Yoon in New York to discuss common and coordinated approaches to regional and global issues. Just as we value our security partnership with Korea, we value Japan's efforts to take on more regional and international responsibilities, bolstered by the passage uh, of its new security legislation. For the first time in nearly two decades, we've updated the guidelines for our defense cooperation so that our forces will be better prepared to flexibly face a range of challenges, from search and rescue missions to peacekeeping operations to disaster response. This will be good for the security and stability and peace and prosperity of the region and good for all the countries in the region, including South Korea. This foundation of peace and stability in the Asia Pacific has not only strengthened our nations, it has also benefited China. As President Clinton is, uh, Obama excuse me, has made clear, we welcome China's peaceful rise, but it matters how it rises. For seven decades, we've invested in a system of international institutions and principles designed to protect and support everyone. And it is profoundly in our shared interest to see that these standards are updated, not undermined. We've sought to broaden and deepen our cooperation with China. We've encouraged China to contribute more, to take up its share of the regional and global burden commensurate with a rising economic and political power. And when our two nations disagree, we don't ignore the differences. We work forthrightly and directly to narrow, if not resolve them. Over the past year, this approach has led to real progress on important issues. It paved the way for a landmark, landmark joint announcement on climate change and brought city, state, and provincial leaders from China and the United States together to surface local solutions to combat global warming. It engaged China in the global response to Ebola. It grounded our work together to craft a deal that prevents Iran from developing nuclear weapons. It produced new confidence-building measures between our militaries, and it sparked growing collaboration to meet development challenges in partner countries from Afghanistan all the way to Sierra Leone. Now, in some key areas, we find ourselves at odds with China's actions, actions that generate friction with others in the region and prevent our relationship from reaching its full potential. Our own values and interests, which we share with the Republic of Korea, Japan, and so many other countries, compel us to address these actions forthrightly, especially China's approach to universal human rights, to economic growth, to maritime security, and to cyberspace. As you know, President Xi recently visited Washington. President Obama raised these and other serious concerns with him during his visit. And President Xi made important pledges to re refrain from economic cyber theft, to investigate cyber crimes, and to hold expert-level dialogues. We welcome these words and expect them to be followed by deeds. We look forward to working with China, the Republic of Korea, and others in the international community to develop much-needed norms for state behavior in cyberspace. President Obama and Xi also had extensive discussions on China's activities in the South and East China Seas. President Obama reiterated the right of all countries to unimpeded commerce and the freedom of navigation and overflight. And he stated that the United States will continue to sail, to fly, and to operate anywhere that international law allows. President Xi publicly pledged to pursue China's claims through peaceful means, to uphold freedom of navigation in accordance with international law, to work with ASEAN countries to conclude rapidly a code of conduct, and set clear, predictable, binding rules of the road. He also said that China will not militarize outposts on features it claims in the Spratly Islands. We appreciate these commitments and expect them to be backed by action that helps significantly lower tension and peacefully resolve any disputes. The world that all of us face today requires collaborative solutions to increasingly complex challenges. That's why we've elevated the East Asia Summit as the premier forum for addressing political and security issues throughout the region. Over the past year, the EAS has made its voice heard on numerous issues of global importance. As the East Asia Summit celebrates its 10th anniversary this year, we look forward to working with ASEAN, South Korea, and others to strengthen it further still. Over the long term, 
we know that the single best way to promote regional security and prosperity is to work together to forge the close partnerships that unlock the talent and unleash the creativity of our citizens and to create ever stronger incentives for cooperation instead of conflict. In this endeavor, the alliance of the United States and South Korea will remain essential, bound not only by shared history and vision, but also by our common belief in the fundamental principles that have enabled the success of both of our countries. Principles like respect for human rights, adherence to democracy, access to free and fair markets, and the paramount importance of the rule of law and an international system based on clear rules and norms. We must continue to lead with these common values, to model our ideals in our deeds and in our example as we strengthen relations among our neighbors of the Asia Pacific, as we work toward a peaceful and unified Korean Peninsula free of nuclear weapons, and as we open new oppor opportunities for all of our citizens. This is our responsibility, and it's one that we're honored to carry across new frontiers with the firmest of allies and closest of friends, the Republic of Korea. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. I'm very much convinced that our future is very bright. And also, but as you said, action must be followed by words. So maybe we have to think about serious the course of the action we have to take together. So now I'd like to open the floor and take some questions from the floor. So actually, uh, let me ask you that. First of all, you have to identify your, yourself, name and affiliation, that it must be a question, not lecture or presentation. <laughs> Okay, there's one. 예, 안녕하세요. 저는 동아일보 조승호 기자라고 합니다. Just, just a minute. Is it simultaneous translation? Is oh, okay. Is oh, oh, I'm sorry. Right here. Just, just hold one on. One second. Make sure that I can get this to work. Uh, 할까요? Okay, let's try. Okay. 예, 저는 동아일보 조승호 기자라고 합니다. 어, 북한도 부장관님의 방안을 잘 알고 있는 것 같습니다. 오늘 오후에 북한 외무상에서 담화를 냈는데요. 어, 자기네들이 북, 어, 미국을 상대로 정전 협정을 공식적으로 다루자고 제의했다는 사실을 공개하고 미국이 이에 응하라고 어, 요구를 했습니다. 어제 이어서 오늘 부장관께서 어, 북한을 향한 인게이지먼트가 진지하다는 점을 거듭 강조를 하셨는데 북한 외무상의 이번 담화에 대해서 미국은 어떤 반응을 보이실 계획이십니까? So did you take the question about this response to... And just to clarify, signing a peace treaty between... Oh, no, actually, they, uh, North Korea offered to have a talk, talks to uh, talk about the, the armistice agreements, ah. how they are going to handle this is directly between mm -hmm. the United States and North Korea. Thank you. Thank you very much. The paramount issue that we face with North Korea is its nuclear and missile program. And the effort at denuclearization is our top priority. North Korea knows very well what it needs to do uh, in order to advance uh, in this area. And we've been very clear about our openness to engaging with North Korea and to uh, getting back to meaningful negotiations. But North Korea must demonstrate that it's prepared for authentic uh, and credible uh, negotiations on denuclearization. Uh, and as I suggested earlier, I think it's very evident that we're serious about this from what happened this summer with Iran and our conclusion of a comprehensive agreement uh, together with our partners with Iran uh, to prevent it from acquiring nuclear weapons. Iran made important decisions to freeze its program, to allow in an international inspectors, and to create an environment in which we could pursue a comprehensive agreement. Uh, and the result was that we succeeded. Uh, and I think that uh, there's a lesson there for uh, North Korea, hopefully, to take uh, to heart. At the same time, we very much support President Park's visit of peaceful uh, unification uh, and hope that uh, over time that is the evolution uh, that we see and that we'll be very uh, pleased to support uh, here. But it really is up uh, to North Korea. and. If it can't even agree 
that it's prepared to talk about and actually take action on denuclearization, then um, it's hard to move forward. So we're looking to North Korea to return uh, to its commitments, to meet its obligations, not just to us, not just to South Korea, but to the entire international community, as is clear from the many Security Council resolutions uh, that call on North Korea to denuclearize. I'd like to, our former ambassador to the United States. Mr. Ambassador. Welcome, uh, Deputy Secretary Blinken. Uh, it's amazing to see such a busy secretary visit Korea twice within eight months. Thank you so much for your interest in Korea. I have two questions. One, first, congratulations on your completion of negotiations of TPP, mm. which is really, really important for the world. Uh, some, some opinions uh, in, in Korea and in Asia is that TPP is, is a kind of a framework mm -hmm. in which United States would like to encircle China uh, economically. And so I'd like to know if China accepts the terms and conditions of TPP, uh, you know, palatable to the 12 uh, negotiating members, China will, United States will welcome China to be the negotiating partner in the future. The second one, directly relating with Korea. Now you completed the negotiations, which is most difficult. From now on, it will be the domestic process within the United States for passing them through U.S. Congress. So I think that for the United States government, you have more time now than when the negotiations is very uh, is conducted in a very hectic way. So is it possible for you from a State Department's point of view that you will create an opportunity for Korea to, to start the negotiations with 12 members in a separate way so that they can complete the negotiations uh, during the time that, that will be taken for you to pass already completed agreements through the Congress. If not, uh, private sector in Korea may fear that it will take more than you know, years so that Korea will be left out of TPP, which is very crucial for countries like Korea and very crucial for the very important relations between the United States and Korea. Thank you. Ambassador, first, it's wonderful to see you, and, and thank you for uh, the, uh, the very important questions. First, um, TPP itself is a significant achievement, and we believe will be tremendously beneficial not just to uh, the United States, but to all the signatories, and indeed, in, 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 in um, many ways, to, uh, to other countries. And we hope very much that it proves to be a vehicle uh, that brings in more participants. Um, it will expand opportunities for trade, for investment, uh, in ways that will significantly increase uh, commerce, open markets, um, produce more growth, result in more jobs, greater choice for, for consumers at better prices. But it will do it in a way that meets the highest standards when it comes to protecting the environment, protecting the labor force, sustaining and protecting intellectual property. In other words, it's a race to the top, not the bottom. Let me be very clear. It is not designed to encircle China. To the contrary, if China uh, is interested in pursuing membership and if it is able to meet the standards, we would welcome that. Um, and indeed, more broadly, as I said, we welcome China's emergence and success, uh, and particularly with regard to China's economy. So many of us are so intertwined that it is to our benefit, to your benefit, that China succeed uh, and prosper. Uh, and so if TPP is a vehicle for furthering that and furthering the integration of countries in this region, we would welcome that. And similarly with, uh, with South Korea, 
Uh, we would welcome pursuing discussions with South Korea if uh, the government wishes to pursue them on TPP. We've had some initial conversations about what would be required, um, but this is something that uh, we would very much look forward to doing. My name is An Chung Young, the professor of economics. Uh, you mentioned that the you know, United States indeed uh, has been the champion of the human rights mm -hmm. and will continue to serve as the champion in raising human rights issues. Mm -hmm. But as you know well, at this point, there exists a big deal of mistrust between Korea and Japan, mm. especially on the you know, comfort women issues. Mm. Well, you know, Korea and Japan are immediate neighbors. And we share the common values on democratic political system and uh, also you know, human rights so forth. But on this issue, I think this uh, you know, US uh, seems to me need to play some intermediation role to uh, bring you know, the understanding of the human rights issues uh, between two countries. Uh, is the United States uh, ready to play any role mm -hmm. in you know, bridging two countries mm -hmm. and eliminating the, uh, the sharp differences on this issue? Thank you. Let me start by saying that the United States has a clear strategic interest in the strongest most positive relationship possible between South Korea and Japan. These are our two closest partners and allies. We have such a broad shared agenda of interests and challenges to meet, and we will be so much more effective in doing that if the relationship between South Korea and Japan is as strong as it possibly can be. And as I mentioned earlier, I saw this again firsthand in the trilateral meeting that we held uh, in New York under the, uh, the leadership of Secretary Kerry and his Korean and Japanese counterparts. Uh, and if you look at what we were uh, able to not only talk about, but coordinate uh, together and cooperate on in terms of issues of great import to all of our people, it's evident that the common interests that we share and the common interests in particular that Japan and Korea share far, far, far outweigh uh, any differences, um, including uh, differences in the past. But it's also clear that the comfort women issue was an egregious violation of human rights. And we have suggested to uh, our friends in Japan that they engage in these issues of historical sensitivity with great sensitivity and in a manner that builds stronger relations in the present. Um, I think that it's worth taking note that there have been repeated statements by uh, the government of Japan upholding the apologies that were issued in the past uh, by former Prime Minister Moriyama and Chief Cabinet Secretary Kono. Um, going forward, it is our hope that this issue can be resolved with direct dialogue, a mutually agreeable solution, and one that promotes healing and sensitivity to the tragic plight of the comfort women, and that then allows a focus on the future. Um, and that is a durable solution so that this problem is resolved once and for all. Um, we continue to make ourselves available to both uh, Japan and Korea to be of assistance if we can be, but this really requires both countries to engage directly with restraint and with a determination and will to resolve the issue in an appropriate manner, a mutually satisfactory one, and then to put the focus on the present and the future. I believe that is very possible, um, and I think great strides have been made uh, over the last uh, six or eight months. Um, 
And it is our hope as a close friend and partner to both countries that they find the will and determination to bring this issue of history to a closing place. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Okay. Leif? Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Secretary. Uh, Leif Easley from the Asan Institute, also a professor at Ihua Women's University. Hmm. Your comments about Iran, uh, about Vietnam, and about Cuba are inspiring. And I hope that the uh, information wall that prevents information from getting inside hmm. the DPRK hmm. uh, has more and more holes in it, hmm. so that inspiring message will, will reach more and more North Koreans. I notice, however, that you didn't list Myanmar on the list this time. Uh, and I wonder if you could speak uh, just for a moment about the upcoming election uh, in Myanmar and if there are opportunities for the U.S. and South Korea to work together uh, in uh, coordinating uh, support for Myanmar's reform uh, and opening process. Thank you. Th thank you. And, and I appreciate you, um, uh, you, you raising that because you're right. I should have mentioned Myanmar. In this, um, in this litany because what we've seen there as well over the last couple of years is an extraordinary change uh, born in part of our own engagement uh, and efforts uh, to um, support uh, change. Um, the upcoming elections are a critically important moment and I was in Myanmar a few months ago and had an opportunity to meet with uh, leaders from across the political spectrum uh, including uh, President Thein Sein, but also uh, Aung San Suu Kyi and others, and conveyed again uh, our expectations that these elections will go forward uh, freely, fairly, transparently. And it's not only our expectation, but the expectation of the international community. Um, it's my sense that the leadership in Myanmar understands and knows the benefits that it's achieved by beginning this process of opening up. They also know what's at risk if they move backward. Um, and that's certainly something that I conveyed during my trip and that other colleagues in the uh, administration uh, have conveyed themselves. I think hearing that message as well uh, from our close partners in South Korea would be uh, very beneficial in the weeks leading up uh, to the election. And we will be watching this very, very carefully. Um, it's uh, a huge challenge. These kinds of, of fundamental change happening in such a short period of time uh, is quite remarkable. And I don't think that uh, we can always expect a perfectly linear progression. But you're exactly right that this moment, the elections, is the critical next step. And I think that um, leadership across the board in Myanmar understands that the world is watching. Thank you. And now? I'm Song Sang-ho, and I'm a reporter from the Korea Herald. Uh, North Korea's nuclear issue here in Korea is uh, an urgent issue because uh, it is uh, growing. The program is growing, and North Korea announced that it has uh, restarted all uh, facilities, nuclear facilities, at the um, main complex in Yongbyon. Mm -hmm. so, uh, but it, the election uh, in the U.S. is coming up, um, and and uh, North Korea does not seem to be high on the foreign policy priority agenda in the U.S. That, that, that's, uh, so there has been sort of like frustration here in Korea regarding that. So would there be any momentum or desire in the U.S. to actually tackle the issue? Or do you think that it would be kind of difficult to move uh, for, for the U.S. to move first uh, unless the North Korea takes the first step? Thank you. Um, I have to tell you that um, it is very high on our agenda. And it's evidenced, again, by the fact that Northeast Asia is at the top of our agenda. The President of the United States has spent a considerable amount uh, of time engaged with, focused on, working with countries in this, uh, in this region. As I mentioned earlier, just in the last few months, the visits to the Oval Office of Prime Minister Abe, President Xi, and next week, President Park, uh, is just one piece of evidence. We have uh, President Jokowi also coming uh, in, uh, in a short period of time. And we had, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the uh, head of the Communist Party in Vietnam. So there's an intense focus on the region. Even though the headlines every day 
talk about Syria or Afghanistan, and obviously we're spending time and resources there, the President has been absolutely determined, as has the Secretary of State, that we maintain our focus and energy on Asia and on the rebalance. And as we're doing that, the problem that you underline, that is the threat posed by North Korea's missile and nuclear program, is front and center. And we spent a tremendous amount of time, for example, as I mentioned earlier, in the visit with uh, President Xi, in engaging directly with him on that challenge. It will certainly be at the top of the agenda uh, when President Park visits. So there's not a lack of focus. There's not a lack of determination. There's not a lack of energy. Uh, and I would say that on some levels we've made progress over the last few years. For example, um, the efforts that have been put in place and that we've sustained and indeed deepened to make it more difficult for North Korea to acquire technology for its nuclear program and its missile program or to sell technology to get money in order to pay for this, I think we've made, taken some significant steps. And we, we were talking about Myanmar a moment ago. Uh, the change in that relationship has had a significant impact uh, on North Korea's ability to finance uh, its efforts. But at the same time, it's also true that with every passing day, North Korea has some ability to improve uh, its missile program and its nuclear program. That means that it is uh, a growing threat to the United States, uh, to Korea, to other countries uh, in the region, which is why we're very focused on it. As I said before, we have demonstrated time and again that we are open and ready to engage North Korea and eventually to engage in negotiations. But if North Korea won't even agree that it's prepared to talk about denuclearization, never mind take some very basic steps that would allow us to have an environment in which we can try to negotiate a comprehensive resolution, as was the case with Iran, it's very hard to get started. There's one other element that I think is important. China has a significant role to play in this effort because it has a unique relationship with North Korea and significant influence. And in our conversations with um, our Chinese friends, we've urged them to use that influence with North Korea to convince it to re-engage in a meaningful, credible, authentic way on denuclearization. And I'm heading actually to um, Beijing tomorrow, and that will certainly be very much uh, at the heart of our agenda there. Thank you. And then, okay, there's one question. Hello, hi. Um, just to follow up on, on some of your of can, some of the can remarks. You, can you identify yourself first? Stephanie Studer of The Economist. Yes. Okay. Um, you were just talking about um, the China-North Korea relationship. Mm. Um, and the sense here in Seoul, at least, is that that relationship is not going very well at mm. the moment. It's, it's quite frosty. Um, my question is whether you think China's fundamental strategic calculus on North Korea has changed or whether it is changing. Um, and I think that that has been, that's long been to prioritize stability. Um, so how, what sorts of pressure do you expect it can bring to bear on North Korea if that basic thinking has not changed? I think that as China looks at the situation uh, on the peninsula and looks at the actions that North Korea has taken repeatedly, um, it would be logical con to conclude that the greatest source of instability in the region is North Korea. And so from China's perspective, I think you're exactly right. It has placed a premium, understandably, on stability. But if the greatest source of instability is North Korea, that would suggest that China um, should have a strong interest in doing what it can to um, influence North Korea to act in a more productive and positive fashion and to engage in denuclearization. Now, a couple of years ago, if you made this argument uh, to the Chinese, uh, I think they would continue to argue that pushing North Korea too hard might actually prove destabilizing in and of itself. But it's hard not to conclude 
with the actions of the, uh, since then, repeated actions by North Korea, uh, provocative actions that are fundamentally destabilizing, that the problem is North Korea. And my hope is that with that growing realization, China will be willing to use some of its influence uh, to convince North Korea to take more positive and productive steps. Um, it has tremendous influence because, of course, it's North Korea's single largest trading partner. And the support that it provides through those normal relations um, outstrips that of any other country by far. So if it were willing to exercise some of that influence, uh, we might have a better opportunity to convince North Korea to re-engage in good faith in credible and authentic uh, negotiations. This is, was very much part of the conversation that uh, China, uh, that, excuse me, President Xi and President Obama had. Um, I would add one other thing. Um, if this situation continues with North Korea, um, and if it continues not just provocative actions, but just continues with uh, its refusal to uh, engage on its obligations and commitments on denuclearization and on its missile program, um, the United States and our partners will have to continue to take steps to defend ourselves. Um, and that means additional defensive measures that are aimed at defending against the threat posed by North Korea, steps that are not aimed at China, but uh, that China might prefer uh, we not take. And I think that has to figure into its calculus as well. Okay. We have time for one last question. Okay. The guy in blue shirts. Yeah, he's going to speak in Korean, please. Thank you. 네, 한겨레 신문의 김지훈 기자라고 합니다. 그, 그 사드 문제에 대해서 좀 여쭙고 싶은데요. 사드의 한반도 배치가 어, 북한과 특히 중국에 대해서 안보에 자신들의 위협이 되고 있다고 하는 상황인데요. 그럼에도 이제 뭐 미국이 대화할 용의가 있다 이렇게 말하는 것이 그 나라들한테는 상당히 모순적으로 비춰지는 것 같습니다. 한반도의 사드 배치에 대한 미국의 입장을 좀 들려주셨으면 좋겠고요. 두 번째로는 그 탄저균 문제, 엔스렉스 문제에 대해서 좀 여쭙고 싶은데, 그 미국에서 그 발송 사고로 인해서 그, 어, 그 조사, 미국에서 조사를 했지만, 그 기술적으로 그것이 살아있는지 죽어있는지 그것을 확인할 수 있는 기술적 능력이 없다고 미국에서도 결론을 내렸는데, 아직 어, 그 부분에 대해서 한국의 그 소파를 개정해야 될 문제가 좀 제기가 되고 있고요. 그래서 한국이 미국의 그런 고위험 병원체를 수입할 때 들여올 때그 한국의 동의를 얻어야 되는 방향으로 소파를 개정해야 된다는 그런 입장들이 있는데 이거에 대해서 어떻게 생각하시는지 좀 궁금합니다. Uh, to deploy it, and any decision would only follow full consultations between the United States and South Korea. Um, but let me also be clear, if we get to a point uh, where we uh, together deploy THAAD, um, it is not about China or aimed at China. It is about the threat posed by North Korea. But even with regard to North Korea, uh, there's no paradox. THAAD is a defensive system not an offensive system. And it is hard to argue, if you're North Korea, that somehow deploying this system or any other missile defense system um, would be uh, confrontational or provocative because its very purpose is to defend against North Korea's own provocations and the growing danger represented by its missile and nuclear program. Uh, with regard to uh, anthrax, I think, as you know, uh, a joint working group was established to review what, uh, what took place. And it is still doing its work. It has not yet reached any conclusions. And so we are waiting for its findings and waiting for its recommendations. Uh, and then together, uh, we will decide if any particular steps need to be taken. I would say that no matter what we do, we have a very strong common interest in ensuring that 
we have strong defensive capabilities against known and credible bio threats, uh, but that those capabilities be pursued safely as well as effectively. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Actually, I was wondering whether he was able to answer those final two questions, but actually he never failed me. So thanks really <laughs> Thank about you. that. Actually, that has brought us to the end of today's event. Please join me thanking Mr. Secretary for his visit to our us and also to sharing his thought with us today. Please join me thanking him. Thank you.